Grendel by John Gardner, chapter 4, page 46. He sings to the heavier harp song now, old heart string scratcher, memory scraper, of the richest of kings made sick of soul by the scattered bones of thanes. By late afternoon, the fire dies down and the columns of smoke is white, no longer greasy. There will be others this year, they know, yet they hang on. The sun backs away from the world like a crab and the dark days grow shorter. The nights grow longer, more dark and dangerous. I smile, angry in the thickening dusk, and feast my eyes on the greatest of meat halls, unsatisfied. His pride. The torch of the kingdoms. Heart. The shaper remains, though now there are nobler courts where he might sing. The pride of creation. He builds this hall by the power of his song, created with casual words, its grave mortality. The boy observes him, tall and solemn, 12 years old, older than the night he first crept in with his stony-eyed master. He knows now, he knows no art but tragedy, a moving singer. The credit is wholly mine. Inspired by the winds, or whatever you please, the old man sang of a glorious mead hall whose light would shine to the ends of the ragged world. The thought took seed in the Rothgar's mind. It grew. He called all his people together and told them his daring scheme. He would build a magnificent mead hall high on a hill, where a view of the western sea, a victory seat near the giant's work. Old ruined fortress from the world's first war to stand forever as a sign of the glorious injustice of Rothgar's Danes. There he would sit and give treasures out, all wealth but the lives of men and the people's land. And so his sons would do after him and his son's sons to the final generation. I listened, huddled in the darkness, tormented, mistrustful. I knew them, had watched them, yet the things he said seemed true. He sent to far kingdoms for woodsmen, carpenters, melsmiths, goldsmiths, also carters, victuallers, clothiers to attend to the workmen, and for weeks their war uproar filled the days and nights. I watched from the vines and boulders of the giant's ruin, two miles off. Then word went out to the race of men that Rothgar's hall was finished. He gave it a name. From neighboring realms and from across the sea came men to the great celebration, the harper sang. I listened, felt myself swept up. I knew very well that all he said was ridiculous. Not light for their darkness, but flattery, illusion, a vortex pulling them from sunlight to heat, a kind of midsummer burgeoning, waltzing to the sickle. Yet I was swept up. Ridiculous, I hissed in the black of the forest. I snatched up a snake from beside my foot and whispered to it. I knew him when, but I couldn't bring out a wicked cackle as I meant to do. My heart was light with Roth Rothgar's goodness and leaden with grief at my own bloodthirsty ways. I went back I backed away, crab-like, further into darkness, like a crab retreating in the pain when you strike two stones at the mouth of his underwater den. I backed away till the honey-sweet lure of the harp no longer mocked me. Yet now my mind was tormented by images. Thanes filled the halls and a great silence crowded them, and a great silent crowd of them spilled out over the surrounding hills, smiling, peaceable, hearing the harper as if not a man in all that in all that lot had ever twisted a knife into his neighbor's chest. Well, then he's changed them, I said, and stumbled and fell on the root of a tree. Why not? Why not? The forest whispered back. Yet not the forest, something deeper, impression from another mind, some lived thing old and terrible. I listened, tensed. Not a sound. He reshapes the world, I whisper, belligerent. So his name implies... He stares strange-eyed at the mindless world and turns dry sickle to gold and, throws, and turns dry sticks to gold. A little poetic, I would readily admit. His manners of speaking was infecting me, making me pompous. Nevertheless, I whisper crossly, but I wouldn't go on. Too conscious all at once, my whispering, my internal posture, always transforming the world with words, changing nothing. I still had the snake in my fist. I set it down. It fled. He takes what he finds, I said stumbly, trying again, and by changing men's minds, he makes the best of it. Why not? But it sounds petulant, and it wasn't true, I knew. He sang for pay, for the praise of woman, one in particular, and for the honor of a famous king's hand on his arm. If the ideas of art were beautiful, that was art's fault, not the shapers. A blind selector among mindless, a bird. Do they murder each other more gently because in the woods sweet songbird sweet songbirds sang 
Yet I wasn't satisfied. His fingers picked involvedly as if moved by something beyond his power, and the words stitched together out of the ancient song, the scenes of interwoven out of dreary tales, made a vision without seeing, an image of himself, yet not himself. Beyond the needs of any shaggy old friend or any shaggy old gold friend's pay. The projected possible. Why not? I whispered, jerking forward, struggling to make my eyes see through the dark trunks and vines. I could feel it all around me, that invisible presence, chilly as the first intima intimation of death, the dusky, unblinking eye of a thousand snakes. There was no sound. I touched a fat, slick loop of vine, prepared to leap back in horror, but it was only vine, no worse, and still no sound, no movement. I got up on my feet, bent over, squinting, and edged back through the trees towards the town. It followed me, whatever it was. I was as sure of that as I'd ever been of anything. And then, in one instant, as if it had all been in my mind, the thing was gone. In the hall, they were laughing. Men and women stood talking in the light of the Mead Hall door and on the narrow street below. On the lower hillside, boys and girls played near the, she near the sheep pens, shyly holding hands. A few lay touching each other in the forest eaves. I thought of how they streak if I suddenly showed my face, and it made me smile. But I held myself back. They talked nothing, stupidities, their soft voices groping like hands. I felt myself tightening, cross, growing restless for no clear reason. I made myself move more slowly. Then, circling the clearing, I stepped on something fleshy and jerked away. It was a man. They cut his throat. His clothes had been stolen. I stared up at the hall, baffled, beginning to shake. They went on talking softly, touching hands, their hair full of light. I lifted up the body and slung it across my shoulder. Then the harp began to play. The crowd grew still. The harper sighed. The old man sang a sweet voice as a child. He told how the earth was first built. The long, long ago said that the greatest of gods made the world, ever wandering bright plain in the turning seas, and set out on signs of his victory, the sun and the moon, great lamps of light to land dwellers. Kingdom torches adorned the fields with all colored shapes, made limbs and leaves, and gave life to the ever creature that moved the, and gave life to every creature that moved on land. The harp turned solemn. He told of an ancient feud between two brothers which split all the world between darkness and light. And I, Grendel, was the dark side. He said, in effect, the terrible race God cursed. I believed him. Such was the power of the shaper's harp. Stood wrinkling my face, laying tears down my nose, grinding my fists into my screaming eyes, even though to do it, I had to squeeze with my elbows the corpse, the proof that both of us were cursed, or neither, that the brothers had never lived, nor the God that judged them. Wah, I bawled. Oh, what a conversion. I staggered out into the open and up towards the hall with my burden, groaning out, mercy, peace. The heart broke off, the people screamed. They had their own version, but this is the truth. Drunken men rushed with me with battle axes. I sank to my knees and cried, friend, friend. They hacked at me, yipped like dogs. I held up the body for protection. Their spears came through it, and one of them nicked me. A tiny scratch high on my left breast, but I knew by the sting it had been a minute. And I understood, as shocked as I'd been the first time, that they could kill me. Eventually would if I gave them a chance, and I struck at them, holding the body as a shield, and two fell, bleeding from my nails at the first little swipe. The others backed off. I crushed the body in my hug, then hurled it in their faces, turned and fled. They didn't follow. I ran to the center of the forest and fell down, panting, my mind wild. Pity, I moaned. Oh, pity, pity. I wept. Strong monsters with teeth like a shark's, and I slammed the earth with such force that it seemed to split open twelve feet long. Bastards, I roared. Sons of bitches. Fuckers. Words I'd picked up from men in their rages. I wasn't even sure what they meant, though I had an idea. Defiance. Rejection of the gods that, for my part, I'd known all along to be lifeless sticks. I roared with laughter, still sobbing. Well, the curse didn't even have words for her swearing in. Ugh. I whooped, then covered my ears and hushed. It sounded silly. My sudden awareness of my foolishness made me calm. I looked up through the treetops, ludicrously hopeful. I think I would half prepared in my dark, demented state to see God. Bearded and gray as geometry, scowling down at me, shaking his bloodless finger. Why can't I have someone to talk to, I said. The star said nothing, but I pretended to ignore the rudeness. The shaper has people to talk to, I said. I wrung my fingers. Rothgar has people to talk to. I thought about it. Perhaps it wasn't true. As a matter of fact, with the shaper's vision of goodness and peace was a part of himself, 
not idle rhymes, then no one would understand him at all, not even Rothgar. And as for Rothgar, if he were serious about his idea of glory, sons and sons giving out treasure, I had news for him. If he had sons, they wouldn't hear his words. They would weigh his silver and gold in their minds. I've watched the generations. I've seen their weasel eyes. I fought down to smi my smile. That could change, I said, shaking my fingers as if at an audience. The shaper may yet improve men's minds, bring peace to the miserable Danes. But they were doomed, I knew, and I was glad. No denying it. Let them wander the frog roads of hell. Two nights later, I went back. I was addicted. The shaper was singing the glorious deeds of dead men, praising war. He sang how they'd fought, for me. they'd fought me. It was all lies. The sly harp rasped like snakes and cattails, glorifying death. I snatched a guard and smashed him on the trees, but my stomach turned at the thought of eating him. Woe to the man, the shaper sang, who shall through wicked hostility shove his soul down into the fire's hug. Or fire's hug. Let him hope for no chance. He can never turn away, but luckily the man who after his death day shall seek the prince, find peace in his father embrace. Bullshit, I whispered through clenched teeth. How was it that he could enrage me so? Why not? The darkness hissed through me. Why not? Why not? Teasing, tormenting as cold as death's hand closed on my wrist. Imagination, I knew. Some evil inside myself pushed out into the trees. I knew what I knew, the mindless mechanical bruteness of things. And when the harper's, when the harper's lure drew my mind away to hopeful dreams, the dark of what was and always was reached out and snatched my feet. And yet I'd be surprised, I had to admit, if anything in myself could be as cold, as dark, as centuries of old, as present as I felt around me, as the presence I felt around me. I touched the vine to reassure myself. It was a snake. I snapped back in terror. Then I calmed myself again. The fangs hadn't hit. It came to me that the presence was still there, somewhere deep, much deeper in the night. I had a feeling that if I let myself, I could fall towards it, that it was pulling me, pulling the whole world in like a whirlpool. Craziness, of course. I got up through the feeling, though the feeling was as strong as ever, and felt my way back through the forest and over to the cliff wall and back to the mirror and to my cave. I lay there listening to the indistinct memory of the shaper song. My mother picked through the bone piles, sullen. I brought no food. Ridiculous, I whispered. She looked at me. It was a cold-blooded lie that a god had lovingly made the world and set out the sun and moon as to light the land dwellers that, brought, that brothers had fought, that one of the races was to save the others cursed. Yet he, the old shaper, might make it true by the sweetness of his harp, his cunning trick trickery. It came to me with a fierce jolt that I wanted it, as they did too, though vicious animals cunning cracked with, the, with theories. I wanted it, yes, even if I must be the outcast, cursed by the rules of his hideous fable. She whimpered, scratched at the nipple I had not suckled on in years. She was pitiful, foul, her smile a jagged white tear in firelight. Waste. She whimpered one sound. Duel, 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 duel. Scratching at her bosom, a ghastly attempt to climb back up to speech. I clamped my eyes shut, listening to the river, and after a time I slept. I sat up with a jerk. The thing was all around me now like a thunder charge. Who is it? I said. No answer. Darkness. My mother was asleep. She was a dead looking as a red gray old sea elephant stretched on the shore of a, summer, of a summer day. I got up and silently left the cave. I went to the cliff wall, then down to the moor. Still nothing. I made my, I made my mind a blank and fell, sank away like a stone through the earth sea towards the dragon.